I've really enjoyed going through this story of Joseph and, and what it meant and we're going to skip most of Genesis 49. I've actually preached that in another church, the blessings of Jacob upon his 12 sons or the, the 12 tribes and, and how that came to fruition but that's a fascinating story by itself. In Genesis 50 we see uh, the death of Jacob. He's embalmed, he becomes, he's been a daddy all his life now, he's made into a mummy and then... <laughs> I wasn't meant to be funny, it's just meant to be curious. Then off they go to back to the land of Canaan where Abraham had bought a cave many, many years before and uh, Joseph and his brothers, they all returned uh, with him and he's buried and uh, then they all come back and uh, so the father Jacob is now dead, uh, dead I should say. What we will now see may well surprise us, but really it's so in keeping with all of human nature. And in a very real sense, it's going to show some of the greatness of this man, Joseph. He really had forgiven his brothers. They had sold him into slavery, thinking they'd got rid of him for the rest of his life. Joseph forgives his brothers, and we, we see there the reason, part of the reason why is he could see the hand of God. He knew God, he knew the place of forgiveness. And Joseph would tell them while they had sold him into slavery, it was also God at work to send Joseph on before them to preserve life. I just wonder, have you recognised the hand of God in your life? And does that enable you to forgive? Do you realise that you've been forgiven so much to be able to come to Christ? Years later, I've mentioned that to Jacob's died, the family have gone back home, they've buried Jacob, and then the brothers come back, and they're back now in the land of Egypt, and their land of plenty, there's plenty happening around them, but they're starting to talk amongst themselves. They're getting scared. I mean, Joseph was really good to them when their dad was alive. Have things changed now that Jacob is dead? What would Joseph do? And there's some very interesting lessons for us. We're in Genesis chapter 50. Move down to verse 15. Genesis 50 verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, Thy father did command before he died saying, So shall ye say, so shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive I pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we briefly skim over this momentous short passage may we grasp some tremendous lessons that are here may your Holy Spirit guide us and enlighten us we pray Lord I thank you for the time of prayer we've just previously had what a joy it is for us to settle our hearts and lift up our voices to you in prayer we thank you Lord God that you're a God that cares for us personally and individually and you can be our individual saviour Thank you, Lord God. I ask for your enablement now and for these dear people to hear that which you would say in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So in verse 15, we notice the brothers are talking amongst themselves. and The general feeling is, will Joseph be spiteful? Will Joseph get us back? Joseph has been quiet all of these years, something like 17 years, I think it was, until the fathers died. And now he will unload on them. Verses 16 and 17. I wonder whether that's a lie 
or a scheme. I wonder if it's true. In fact, verse 16 says, And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren. I wonder whether Jacob really did send a messenger to the brother, sorry, to the, um, to the, you know, for Joseph to say to forgive. Or was that manufactured? You know, the brothers are just saying that so that Joseph will be soft with them. I sort of think perhaps I've said that to save their own skins. Now, you can differ with me if you like. You can uh, um, have a different point of view, but I think they've done that to save their own skins. The brothers were worried about Joseph, and so what they're saying, in effect, is we just thought we should tell you that before Dad died, he wanted us to tell you that you should be merciful to us. You know, just remember, this is what the sort of thing Dad would have said. How does Joseph react to this? Verse 17 is amazing because Joseph wept. Now, I believe he wept because he was so hurt that they would have thought that he wanted to hurt them. The fact that they would even send a message like this suggests that that's what they would have done if they were in Joseph's shoes. If they were in Joseph's shoes, they would have done it. They had judged Joseph by their own standard and without realising, they showed still how much was wrong in their own hearts. What made Joseph weep was that he could say to himself, do you really think I have been a hypocrite for the last 17 years while my dad has been alive here in Egypt? Do you really think that the whole time that you've been living here in Goshen, I've been putting on a big act? That I didn't mean it the first time when I said that God meant it for good? So we're in a position where Joseph is now having to forgive them for what they've already done. So he goes back and he acknowledges that, yes, you did do evil against me in selling me into slavery. We saw that in verse 20. The brothers had brought it up, so Joseph acknowledges it. Yes, you did think evil. You were cruel. But he's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. God has meant all of this for good. God is doing something good out of this. And Joseph would then demonstrate that, in fact, he's forgiven them all along. But isn't it amazing for those 17 years the brothers had lived under the fear? Perhaps they're not really forgiven Perhaps Joseph was really waiting his own time. Perhaps you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, but you can't really believe that he's forgiven you. That he's really forgiven you. Because he has. Why do we have those thoughts that God can't forgive us? It could be like the brothers. We're actually judging God by our own standards. And the reason we have so much difficulty um, accepting God's forgiveness is because we have difficulty forgiving another person. And then we project that thought, well, if we can't forgive them, how could God ever forgive us? And then we start to think, I don't really think God has forgiven me. it can be a startling discovery, especially for older Christians, to realise what they should have known, that God really does forgive us. I mean, sometimes it takes older Christians a long time. God really has forgiven. He really has wiped the slate clean. That all of that sin in my past, it, it has been washed away. It's completely gone, forgiven, forgotten. Never will that sin in your past be held against you. Because if you've asked God, by God's grace, to wash away your sins by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, folks, they're gone. They're absolutely gone. The brothers of Joseph knew that they had done wrong. They'd sold him into slavery and they owned up to it. We're called sometimes to forgive people that don't own up to what they've done that have gone and hurt us in some way or they've grieved us in some way and they won't own up to it. They don't think they've done 
anything wrong. They can be hard people to forgive. People that think they haven't done anything wrong are the hardest to forgive. I've mentioned this is the last message on this series in Joseph. But I want to hit this important point of showing how you can really know that you have forgiven another person. Some people say they've forgiven, but they say, I'll never forget though. And you know that there's something deep down they haven't really forgiven. Joseph was a truly a great man of God, not just because he had faith in God, not just because he saw God's hand, but knowing God, he was able to forgive. And if you and I know God, we too are able to forgive. I'm going to give four proofs of forgiveness. The first is in verse 19, Genesis 50, 19. And that simply reads, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. And I'm going to stop there. The first proof is that you don't want the forgiven person to be afraid of you. You know how some people, they like to say, well, yes, you're forgiven, but you leave them uneasy. You know, they, they, they're not sure if they're really forgiven and, and you're cool. You want them to suffer or to think about it a little bit in your mind. Sometimes people will refuse to be friendly. So the other person starts to worry. They've got this fear. Well, maybe they're just saying that. You know, they're not really being warm about that. Why do we do this? What is it in human nature that we do this? Why is it that we act as though we haven't seen them or or we sort of look the other way when we could say hello? Or maybe we put a smile on but underneath we're gritting our teeth and and the other person, they know it's a cold, cold smile. Why do we do that? There's a biblical reason, well it's not a biblical reason but it's a it's a biblical sin, perhaps I should say. We want to control them in some way so that they're afraid of us. They're still feeling they want to control us and they want to leave a little bit of fear there. And it's, uh, it's something that's there. In 1 John 4, He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So when you want another person to be afraid, not only have you not truly forgiven them, but they're feeling fear for you and you're actually got to putting a fear upon them. Joseph would say, fear not. He wasn't holding anything over them. And do we hold things over people when we forgive them? There's a second proof of forgiveness and that's you refuse to take any advantage of any superior position that you might have. Look again in verse 19. Joseph said, fear not. For am I in the place of God? I mean, Joseph could have used his position as the Prime Minister of Egypt to make them afraid. He could have said, well, fellas, I'm the boss around here. You've got to do as you're told. You're going to be grinding. You're going to be doing this. You're going to be doing that. And and, uh, he could have made his brothers toe the line. He could have got them to be doing the things that he wanted them to do. They would have done it out of fear and they would have done it out of respecting his authority. Sometimes that's the only way a person can get respect from another, is to use an authority, to use a higher position. Uh, We have police forces. They wear a uniform so that when a person comes in the uniform, you automatically say, yes, there's a sense of authority that comes with the uniform. We know what it represents. So a policeman gets respect by wearing his uniform. Joseph wasn't wearing his prime minister's uniform to get respect. He was open, he's transparent with them. He's going to say, I'm not in the place of God. And you're actually putting yourself in the place of God if you force another to respect you. And you do that because you haven't really forgiven them. You have forgiven them sorry, have forgiven, when you refuse to let another person even think that you are something special. When you don't try to be something special yourself, you're just the same as them. And as soon as you start saying, well, I'm something special and you've hurt me and and I'm so and so and you shouldn't have done that, you're you're using that position of authority or whatever else it is. You're not forgiving. Joseph, Joseph would say, as for you, ye thought evil of me. 
And Joseph was actually acknowledging they had thought evil and they had done evil. And he wouldn't have said it if they hadn't have brought it up. But now that they've brought it up, he's forced to mention it. He would never have said, hey, fellas, remember you did wrong by me, but I've forgiven you. He would never have brought it up. But they've brought it up. And so he says that he's forced to mention it. And in actually by doing that, by admitting that, it's actually made his job easier. As I said, it's harder to forgive someone when they don't know that they've done wrong or they don't think that they have done wrong. Therefore, there's a parallel that comes out is to be able to say God meant it for good is an attitude that we have. It's an attitude we must feel towards those who won't admit anything. They're still hard harder to us, but we've got to think in our minds, God's meant it for good, they've hurt me, I'll hand this over to God. God can use this. And so we can forgive them even though they're not looking for it, even though they're still hard to us. So whether they say they're sorry or not, it shouldn't matter. If we can see the hand of God, if we can trust it and leave it in God's hands, that's what matters. We understand then that all things can work together for good, that God actually has got your life in his hands. And whatever affects you, affects him. Whatever affects you, affects him. And when you start to realise that, you're becoming free. When you realise we're not alone in this world, he is with us. And we can hand things to him. And we don't have to worry about revenge or anything else. And what's more, for you and I, if we're children of God here, if you've given your life to the Lord, if you're a saved person, if you acknowledge your sin and you've, you've, you've humbled yourself before God, then there's a, the real sense is that you can hand all of this to God and it's like God puts it into his computer, he puts it in and says, now I'm going to use this and turn this around for good for this person. For all of these things that have happened, I'm going to use it for good. If that child of mine will just allow me time and space to work and, and do things, if that child will allow me to work. Many people don't give God time. They want to take things into their own hands and to see the principle, you know, to see action for themselves. Now there's a case we could go through Matthew 18 if someone sins against you to go and speak to them and to take a, a, a witness with you. But otherwise, there's this principle of where vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and we're to hold back, we're to try and leave it in God's hands and to see how God will work some of these things through for good. The Christian is a person who has the opportunity to show that he sees God's hidden purpose in those things that are happening, especially the evil things. And that is something the non-Christian will never see. The non-Christian will never see there's a purpose in the troubles that come their way because they can't grasp it. They don't have the vision for it. When the non-Christian sees evil or injustice, he might shake his fist at heaven and say, if there's a God, I'm going to hate him. You know, how could God let this happen? If he really exists, this wouldn't happen. God, wherever you are, I'd like to give you a piece of my mind. But the Christian sees the same thing and he'll say something like, Lord God, I know that you're in control and I'll wait and trust in you. And Lord God, I know that this is not the end. I know that while there is yet time, there is always time for you to work. The non-Christian will see a disaster. It might be a hurricane or an accident, an industrial accident, or it might be losing a job or losing a friend. I say, oh, it's all over. I've just been ruined. This has just left me devastated. But the Christian is not like that. The Christian says, it is not over yet. Life is still in God's hands. I will trust him. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him as Job has said. There's a third proof. The first proof, Joseph didn't want the brothers to be afraid. And when we talk about forgiving people, we don't try to put fear in their mind or, or hold something over them. There's a second proof. 
you don't take advantage of any advantage that you have against them because you're on level ground, you love them. Third proof, Genesis 45, 5. Jo- Joseph had already told them that God had sent him to preserve life. In Genesis 50, 20, God says he meant it, sorry, Joseph said he meant it for good. Look at verse 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. What is Joseph doing? He's healing up that wound. He's getting those brothers to understand, look, this is the work of God. I don't have any need to to come out and and give you a hard time. I'm not going to punish you because God has wound all of this up. This is all the workings of God and I'll rest in that. And and it was really meant to be. He, He saved them face, we could say. And we, all of us go through life and there are some things that may well be meant to be but we don't understand it. We can all understand. We don't understand why certain things happen. We are self, basically we're selfish people. We have bad attitudes. We deserve punishment. We deserve hell. That's what we deserve. But it pleased the Lord to bruise the Lord Jesus Christ. It pleased the Lord that the Lord Jesus Christ would come and die in our place. Otherwise, we would be going to hell. We mentioned earlier the cricketer that has died recently. He's either gone to heaven or he's gone to hell. What a mystery. That we as wicked mankind crucified Christ, and yet Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So God could say, I did it. God had meant it for good. Crucifying Christ was a wicked act by mankind, yet it all happened by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God. We sometimes grapple with, That's, how could that be for good? And yet you and I know that it was for good, that God uses it greatly. So too is the believer's life a mystery. Your life is something special to God. It's a mystery. God may lead us through tragedies, yet it is for good. Sometimes it's a tragedy that brings us to our knees. Oftentimes it's in a tragedy that the Holy Spirit brings a person to call out to God for help. In fact, at the back of my mind somewhere, someone has said was that God speaks the softest in the good times, but shouts at us in the hard times. Something like that. I can't remember how it goes exactly. Um, Often it's the kindness of God that he lets certain things happen to us. It's a wake-up call. It gets us to see certain things that we may never have seen otherwise. And when we start to look like that, we start to say, yeah, there's more in this than than meets the eye. And that frees you up. You can forgive. That person has hurt me. I feel upset with them. But I know that God meant it for good. And I know that I can learn from it. And it gives us a freedom, a freedom to really forgive. There's a fourth and a final proof that you've really forgiven the person. And this is really profound, that you keep on forgiving them. I mean, it's one thing to say, yes, I've forgiven you, and then to walk away from that. But it's the second thing, to continually to forgive them and to mean it. How do you know you've really forgiven them? Well, the answer is you just keep on doing it. Have a look in verse 21. Joseph says, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. All that said, he's forgiven them and he's proved it. He's going to continue to act the right way and be a a carer for them and comfort them. And he would do this till the end of his days, until the day that he dies. How long does forgiveness last? Should till the day we die? Well, I suppose for the rest of our time. It's in God's hand, isn't it? Let me ask you a question. Do you bring up your old hurts to God? Do you bring up things where people have hurt you to God? Do you talk about it with your marriage partner or your friends and talk about people that have hurt you? When God forgives, it is for all time. That's very profound. When God forgives, 
It is for all time. It's like when he saves a person, it is for all time. He gives us eternal life. He doesn't give us temporary life. When God forgives, it is for all time. That is his nature. When he gives us eternal... The moment we save, we get eternal security. God would never ask us to forgive another when he wouldn't do the same. Did you get that? God wouldn't ask you to forgive someone else if he couldn't forgive. And he does forgive. He forgives us. And we can know it personally. We can look at the cross and we can see proof of that. That God forgives. It's natural for us as fallen creatures to want revenge or vindication perhaps. Joseph never took revenge. Why not? Because he had his eyes on another world. Because he saw the affairs of God in his world. Oh, he had some hard lessons to learn in the jail and and, uh, to, to come through before he could trust God in it, but he saw God in the affairs of this world around him. Folks, much of the book of Genesis is written around Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, And then we've looked at Joseph over a number of weeks and over a number of chapters. Joseph is a wonderful man. He's a type of Christ. He's able to forgive. But let me ask you a question. Maybe I should stop and really let you answer it. What does the writer of Hebrews say about Joseph? What is Joseph? I can see some of you thinking. What is Joseph actually remembered for? Bob Bennett, put your Bible down. (laughs) What is Joseph remembered for? In Hebrews, as a man of faith, what is he actually remembered for? Because the answer is insightful, it's surprising, it's startling. Let me give it to you before Bob gets it. Hebrews 11.22 By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Isn't that amazing? Of all that the writer of Hebrews could have said, that's all he wrote. Why this? Because Joseph was thinking about life beyond the grave. And he's thinking about the promises of God, especially to Abraham. Abraham had made promises regarding Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and this nation that would come from them. They would come back into the land. The land has been promised to them. He knew that his bones would be carried up into the land. He knew there were promises being made. And he also had the sense of this promised land both that he would never get to but his descendants would, the literal land of Israel but there's also the great promised land which we might also call heaven. Scriptures say that Abraham is great-grandfather had gone about looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. He was looking for something that wasn't on this earth. He had his eyes further past this lifetime. And Joseph, in his mind, wanted to be identified with heaven. He didn't want to be identified with Egypt. He's going to live his life out in Egypt, but he was going to be with God. He was going to go to heaven. Do you think for one minute, that Joseph would want a blemish on his life. At the end of his life, he's looking to heaven. I'm going to go there for him to turn around and be spiteful to his brothers. For him not to, to, to go to heaven and, and to have this unforgiveness in his heart. I mean, how little, belittling is that? How pathetic would that be for Joseph, who is now look getting to the end of his life and he knows that he's going to go to the city whose maker is God, to be with God and still hold a grudge? How trivial. When we should be looking at the excitement of all that heaven holds and the glory and and to see our Lord Jesus Christ and to be holding grudges, not to be able to forgive, not to be able to get on with others, Joseph was going to heaven. You see, 
That was easy for Joseph to say, God meant it for good because in his mind he could say, yes, God, you've meant it for good and and I'm going to go to be with you. He had forgiven his brothers a long, long time before. In fact, he had forgiven them after he'd tested them and knew where they stood. It was easy for him to forgive because his thinking wasn't in the present. His thinking was beyond the earth. His thinking was towards the presence of God. And when our thinking becomes wrapped up in the things of heaven, when our thinking becomes wrapped up in where we're going, some of these things on this world become less important. Some of these things of tiffs and fights and snuffs and or whatever else it is are so trivial when there's heaven's glory ahead and the purity of being in the presence of God and and why are we so bound down with this sin and these things that so easily wrap us up and and hold us do your thoughts go to heaven have you been looking forward one day to going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ Do do you think about it oh there was there's You know, we've said over the last few weeks, people here have been talking about the the role of hell. Hell is real. It was said that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has said much more on hell and the reality of hell than he has on heaven. Hell is real. It's And heaven is real. And heaven is only for those that are going to be transformed. We can't get there by our own steam. We can't get there unless we're changed. We can't get there unless God has given us his Holy Spirit as children of God. If you're rejecting God and his Holy Spirit and thinking, well, I'm going to live a good Christian life, you'll go to hell. You need the Holy Spirit as a testimony. We need to be able to, Lord Jesus, sorry, the Heavenly Father looks down and says, yes, I can see they're a sinner, but they're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And it's a beautiful righteousness. The beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no place on this earth for holding a grudge. Joseph meant it for good. He said God meant it for good and and what he had said was right. And Joseph was only telling them the truth. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Oh folks this raises a strange question and I'm not going to expect you even to answer it did it mean good for Joseph? Well we know that the end of the story was good but what about in your life the things that God means for good how do we define good? What does good mean in your life when all things work together for good and you say how could it work for good when this has happened and this has happened and this I'm in these circumstances Well, I only know that God is good and we know what God is like. And sometimes we don't understand it, but we will trust God through that. So having said that, may we learn contentment. For what God calls good is good enough. May we learn the preciousness of both to forgive and to know forgiveness. I would even say that the Christian life is not real without understanding forgiveness. If you don't understand forgiveness, are you saved? Are you saved? So let me close and ask the question, do you know what it is to forgive? Do you have a forgiving spirit? Let's pray.